We're in chapter 3 this morning, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 18 and 19. Verse 18 is a command to wives, as it says, to submit to their husbands. We'll be spending 45 minutes there. (laughs) And then I'll just ignore verse 19. But reading at verses 18 and 19, Wives, submit to your own husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter toward them. So let me lay a foundation, again awaken you to the context, and then look to put verses 18 and 19 into a personal application. So as we've started and have studied through the book of Colossians, I have mentioned to you that the first two chapters of Colossians, chapters 1 and 2, are chapters that are laying down doctrinal um, truths. That's because belief always directs behavior. So doctrine, teaching, doctrine comes before doing. So for two chapters, he's been teaching the Colossians and us who we are in Christ. And he's been giving us the doctrine that relates to who Jesus is, what he has done, and and all of that. So by the time we get to chapter 3, he begins to give personal application, things that we're supposed to do. So in chapter 3, the first verses that he gives to us commands us to take off the old life and put on a new life. And he has begun to share with us in chapter 3 the things that we're to take off or to put to death. And so he said this, he said, put to death fornication, uncleanness, evil passions and desires. And he said, put to death covetousness. Now, all of those sins that were mentioned are associated with unlawful sexual conduct. When he moves into verses 8 and 9, he says that believers are also to put off a variety of other sins. We're to put off anger and wrath. We're to put off malice and blasphemy. We're to put off filthy language and lying. And this is because the old life has been put to death. It's been put away. And because we're new in Christ, we have a new life. You see, we need to remember that when we came to faith in Christ, when we were born again, the old life was put to death. Paul speaks of that in the book of Romans in chapter 6, verse 6, when he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So that old man refers to our old manner of life, a a manner of life that was in rebellion to God and a, a manner of life that was in spiritual bondage. And so he's saying in Christ, we're no longer slaves to and no longer to be dominated by our sin. Now that's made possible because we're ruled by Jesus, and now in Christ we're free. Remember in John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36, Jesus was speaking, and he answered them. And he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And so we've been set free Sin is not to dominate us any longer. We're to now walk in what he calls newness of life. And that is made possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, you can't walk in a new life in your own flesh, in your own attempts. You you can't do that. You need help. And so God has provided not only the command, but also the power. He's not giving me something I can't do. He gives me the, the power. He equips me to be able to do those things that he commands me to do. And that power is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. In Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, he says, The exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Do you realize that? That today, if you're a born-again believer, the temple of the Holy Spirit, do you realize today that God has given you the power 
to be able to live for him, to be recognizing yourself as, as, as crucified in Christ and yet alive. I was sharing just last week, we had, we had a wonderful, wonderful Sunday service. As you who are here with us know, I was teaching on marriage. Then we had a wedding ceremony and uh, five couples uh, who had been living together for some time, some of them, had gotten right with the Lord, and we performed their wedding for them. And, and then on, on Sunday night, we had our baptism, and, and three of those couples got baptized on Sunday night, you know. And that's a great day of ministry. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. And, and as I was sharing with, with, with everybody Sunday night, I was sharing how that when you're baptized, it's a, it's a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. And so you're dead in Christ. And, and so I was sharing, you go down into the water, it's a picture of death and burial. But then you're raised again. But the way that you're raised again is by the power of the Holy Spirit who raised Christ himself from the dead. If you're born again, you need to grab hold of this. Because if you're born again, that power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And if you understand that, that gives you that place, that foundation of, of living for Christ in a way so that, that, that sin will no longer have domination over you. A lot of times people say, I can't help myself. Well, you're right. You can't help yourself completely. But with God, with Christ, I can do all things. So I, I can walk in the Spirit. I can recognize myself to be dead to sin, yet alive in Christ. And, and I can have a victorious Christian life, not because I try so hard, but because he made it possible for me to, by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that now lives within me. And that's a new life. And this new life is evidence of Christian is, is, is a believer. This is the evidence that you know the Lord. Uh, you're, you're growing to be holy, and, and you're beloved by God himself. And so this new life is known for certain things. It's known for compassion. It's known for kindness. It's, it's known by humility and meekness, long-suffering, and forgiveness. And so as, as Paul was speaking about those things, notice verse 14. He said, but above all these things... Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. In other words, love is a final garment that completes the ensemble and binds everything together. It's real. It's real by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not something you're putting on. You know, it's, it's not that difficult to appear to have compassion or to have kindness and humility. It's not that hard to have the appearance of it, but in fact, to be insincere. Because if your motives are improper, the behavior is not the genuine fruit of the Spirit. Artificial fruit can appear real until you try to eat some of it. And if you do not have love as the outer garment, the rest of all of this is just outer appearances. So Paul concluded that section with the exhortation for us to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus now, he's been speaking concerning their relationships that they have in the body of Christ. And now he's speaking about the relationship of a wife and her husband. So he begins in verse 18 by giving the command to the wife. Wife, submit to your own husbands at his fitting, as is fitting in the Lord. Now, we'll look at that for the next hour. Christians live under the principle of doing all things in the name of Jesus Christ. Our lives are to be lived in such a way that we are what are called living testimonies. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Paul said, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In verse 23, in chapter 3 here, he says, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So, Paul is speaking about doing things as unto the Lord, doing things in the name of Jesus Christ. And he's giving practical teaching about doing everything in his name. And he begins with the home. 
He begins with a wife. And he builds on the foundation of submission. And he says, submit to your own husband. Not somebody else's husband. Submit to your own husband is what he is saying. And we'll look at that. We need to remember that submission is what has been called a general Christian duty. It's actually something all Christians are called to do. In Ephesians 5.21, Paul said, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's something that is a general condition of the church. This fellowship, this church would not be able to, to do anything if we didn't submit to one another, if we didn't work with one another and all of that. That's a general thing. But we need to remember that submission is something that is done, according to Ephesians 5.21, in the fear of God. So in, in, in that context, a Christian wife's submission to her husband is part of what she as a Christian will do. Again, Christians are to be submissive to one another, but in the family, wives are working within the framework of biblical headship. In 1 Corinthians 11.3, Paul said, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That's an order of authority. So the attitude of submission is an attitude that encourages health and stability in the family. It establishes and helps to maintain a proper authority in the home. Now, obviously, marriage already existed prior to Christian marriage. Christian marriage at this time is really something brand new. So what Paul is doing is he's echoing the established norm and in his command to submit, as is fitting in the Lord, what he's doing is he's baptizing marriage in Christ. And he's not suggesting that women are inferior. He's stating that God receives glory by this. Now, the Apostle Peter spoke of submission in a different way. In 1 Peter 3, verse 1, he wrote that wives are to be submissive to their own husbands. This even included unbelieving husbands who would observe their way of life. Their submission, Peter was saying, was the fruit of their pure lives and the fear of the Lord. Because in the same passage in 1 Peter 3, he also commanded wives to cultivate what he called the hidden person of the heart. He spoke of the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. He said that women have always adorned themselves in this manner, holy women. Now, this did not make women less in reality, it made them worthy of emulation. They were women of character. They were honoring the Lord by their lifestyle. They were cultivating a gentle and quiet spirit, and that gave great honor to God, as well as to the husband. Now, in our day, we're saturated with commercials that advertise outward beauty. <laughs> According to one online research institute, in 2018, the cosmetic industry spent $56,875,000,000 in advertising. That is an awful lot of emphasis on cosmetics. Another thing that I found interesting is a recent survey done by Beauty E. Taylor Skin Store showed that women in the United States spend about $300,000 just on their face. <laughs> <laughs> during their lifetime. It's a lot of money. There are, I'll put it this way, how, how many ads have you seen, commercials on television, that promote the cultivation of inner beauty? How many have you seen? I don't think I've ever seen one. Uh, a commercial that specifically says, we have something we're selling, you ladies, that will make you beautiful on the inside. We don't have that because that's not a product that, that, that people are actually um, looking to buy. And, and there's nobody putting together any products that can do that. There, there aren't, I don't know any, any ads that promote cultivating inner beauty. So what that has done is that simply has, uh, has lent itself to the overemphasis of external beauty, the outward appearance. And that's what a lot of people work on, the outer appearance. And, 
And I understand that. I get it. I really do. I mean, I, I would like to look as good as I could. I do the best I can. When you don't have much to work with, when you begin with, you do your best to touch it up. I get it. I get it. But no matter what, the bottom line is, is we used to talk about ladies having an hourglass figure. That's an old saying, right? An hourglass figure. Well, we need to remember that the sand does shift to the bottom eventually. <laughs> that just does. So, <laughs> you just have to be aware of that. I mean, we can spend... <laughs> We can spend millions of dollars on the outside. And again, there's, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with us doing the best we can to, to work with what God has given to us. And I think that's a good thing. I'm, I tease with you, but I also want to emphasize what really matters at the end. In the end, it's what kind of person you are. It, it's your character. That's what is important when it's all said and done. Beauty is fading. It's only temporary. We know that. We don't know that well when we're young. We know that when we get older and we realize that beauty was fading. And it, it, it is. That's just the nature of, of what it is. I mean, you know, I've lived long enough to see some women who were, were say, uh, they, they would say of them, this is the most beautiful woman. And in, in her day, she was a very beautiful woman. But she's going to be replaced by a woman younger than her. That's just the way it is in, in the movies and all. You'll see someone, oh, she's so beautiful and this and that. And as I've had the privilege and blessing of the Lord to grow older, I can remember women who, when I was young, who were older than I, that were very beautiful women. They aged beautifully. They age, you know, but you still see them as older women. And I've, I've heard the uh, actresses who have said, you know, I started out my career playing the beautiful young lady. Now I'm playing the grandmother. And the bottom line is, is at least you still got a job. But there's nothing wrong with being the grandmother. And sometimes, perhaps we think there is something wrong. You know, want to be the hottest grandma in town, please. <laughs> so something else has to be cultivated if you want to, to be remembered. So Peter says it's the hidden person of the heart. And he made it clear that this kind of life might even win an unbelieving husband to Christ. When writing of Sarah's relationship to Abraham, uh, Peter said that she called him Lord. In 1 Peter 3, 6, it says Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, when she called him Lord, that referred to her respect for him. It was a respect that she had for Abraham that came out of a godly heart. When you read about Sarah and Abraham, I won't go through their story with you, but other than to say, when you read about it, you'll see that Abraham had his moments. He, uh, he wasn't always the man that was as honorable as he became. And yet, you see that she still showed him respect and showed him the love that a wife offers to a husband. And that's why Peter is making it very clear that she called him Lord because she reverenced and respected this man and so Paul is speaking about a relationship between a husband and wife, and he is beginning with the wife when he does say in verse 18, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And so submit to your husbands. Notice as is fitting in the Lord. In Ephesians 5.22, that verse reads, wives, submit, to your husband, uh, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. So a wife's submission ultimately reveals her relationship to the Lord. Again, this doesn't lessen the woman. It increases the possibility of, of order in the home. One commentator said, this speaks of the attitude of unselfish service emphasized by the special fact of man's ordained leadership. Her submission is also spoken of as fitting. That word fitting means proper or appropriate. It is fitting, someone said, both in regard of God's command as well as in the light of the evil that would arise from the neglect of this duty. And so, I don't take submission lightly. It's, it's one of the areas of marriage that is most difficult to actually practice. And, and I understand that such an attitude is difficult to have, and it creates conflict. I realize that. 
Fact is, human nature being what it is, we want what we want, when we want it, and it can become a battle that is waged in marriage. In some ways, we see submission as giving up power to someone else, and that's really the proper definition. But sometimes we don't trust them. Sometimes we've come to not have confidence in them. And it's difficult to yield because you know in the past it hasn't always gone well. It, it, can, it can take years to finally find a place of mutual respect and compromise. But it's, it's worth it because it helps us to have peace in our lives and peace in our homes. See, as a kid, I grew up in a home that was, on occasion, very difficult to live in. My mom battled with sicknesses of various sorts that began when she was 24. My dad bought my mother a new car when she was 25. But for years, she couldn't drive that brand new car. My mom had epilepsy. Her first epileptic seizure was when she was around 24, 25 years old. My dad had just bought her a 55 Chevy. Brand new. And he would leave the keys. He didn't take them and hide them so she wouldn't drive. He would leave the keys. She knew where they were, but my mom, out of respect for the law, because her driver's license had been taken from her, she couldn't drive because of her seizures that she was having so frequently. But my mom told me years later when I was in my teens, my mom said to me, you know, your dad never hid the keys from me. I always knew exactly where they were, but out of respect for my husband and the law, I chose not to drive my brand new car. That's an attitude that I learned from. I, I, I saw how my mom was with my father. I saw that my mom had a submitted heart to him, even as a non-believer. I'm not saying my mom was perfect. God knows she, she wasn't. She was a human being who had her own faults and, and problems. But my mom had a respect for my father, and we'll look at that in just a moment. And that was what I learned. I watched that as I grew up. I watched that attitude. I, I saw her as she lived out so many things. And ultimately, as she got older and got saved, I saw it even more, even clearer. But I saw these things. That my mom was a woman who served. My mom was, was that mother. Perhaps you had a mother like my mom. Maybe you are that mother. When my mom would, when my mom would make dinner for the family, and again, remember, as I mentioned, my mom had, had been very ill, but she still made, made dinner for the family. She, she, she fought that illness as much as she could. And, and I can still, I can tell you this, that I don't remember as a child growing up, I don't remember my mom ever really sitting at the table eating dinner with us. My mom would stand next to the stove and she would take her plate and put it on the kitchen sink. And as she ate standing, my mom would look to my dad and say, Frank, do you need something? And my dad would look at his plate. He'd say, no, I'm good. She'd go, okay, let me know. And I watched that. I watched that as I grew up. I watched my mom do those kinds of things. I watched my mom serve my father, and it, and it taught me that, that there's a relationship that you can have where, where it's not a lesser, it, you're not being less than by caring for someone. You're actually showing them that you love it. Man, I saw that. Now I realize not every home's the same. And, and we men who are married, we're big boys. We can, we can serve ourselves. I, I get that too. But I happened to have been blessed to marry a woman that does the same thing, my wife Marie. My wife, Marie, is still, it, she, she does the same thing. Now, she fell down and broke her kneecap last, uh, two weeks ago. She was carrying me and tripped. <laughs> Come on, work out. I'll get you a gym membership. No, she was in the, she was in the, um, in, uh, doing the wash. And she picked up some things out of the, uh, out of the uh, uh, dryer. And there was a box that I put, I, no, there was a box that was there. <laughs> and she tripped over it and fell. And, and have, she has a hairline fracture on her left knee. And, uh, and yet, yesterday at dinner, dinner time, 
she came and she sat down next to me. And she was eating next to me and was sitting on the couch. And I start to stand up. And the first thing she's saying is, what do you need? What do you need? She's wanting to get up to go get me something. And her kneecap's broken. And I looked at her. I said, baby, you know what? You could have done it. Why didn't you? <laughs> no. Here you are sitting and eating and making me feel like a fool. <laughs> no, I said, baby, I can do it myself. I, I don't. But that, see, I married a woman like that. And uh, I was with a friend of mine one time years ago. I've said this before. Perhaps some of you may remember. We were, we were uh, 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 on a tour with a lot of pastors. And, and there were 300 people all together, including the pastors. And I sat down. And there was a line of 300 people. A line of the 300 people. And I sat down. And I was at a table. And one of my friends, a pastor friend of mine, walks up and says, um, what are you doing? I said, yeah, and I'm waiting. He said, what for? I said, um, I said, Marie's getting me something to eat. He said, aren't you going to get up and get in line? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, because my wife's getting me something. She's getting me a plate. He looks at me and he goes, how'd you get her to do that? <laughs> I said, do what? <laughs> this is a true story. This is a true story. How'd you get her to do that? Because his wife's there with her plate. Yeah, you know. <laughs> True. He said, how'd you get her to do that? Do what? How'd you get her to stand in line to get you a plate? I said, hmm, I love her. He goes, yeah, I know, but how did you get her to get you a plate? See, that's me. I'm spoiled, and I thank God for that. Every day, I am. I realize it. You may not do that. That's between, it's not good, it's not bad, it just is. I'm not judging you if you do or don't. Simply saying that I've learned a long time ago that when a husband loves a wife, the wife wants to please the husband. When the husband loves her, and we'll see that in a minute, man. When the husband loves her, there's not enough she can do for him. And so standing in line with 300 people, bringing you a plate and then going back to get herself, that's normal in my house. That's the way it is, because I was raised that way with an unbelieving mother who got saved when she was 40, but she knew that love for her husband was service to him. She knew that. Again, I'm not saying you're bad if you don't. I'm simply saying you work things out. It's like a dance. Every marriage, eventually, you have your own dance steps. Every marriage. We have two sinks at, in our bedroom. Marie has to use mine. <laughs> and so she'll just come and step in front of me, and I'll just take a step back. And then she'll step away, and I'll step forward, you know, Front, back, cha, cha, cha. That's what we do at the house all the time. <laughs> but it's a dance. We don't even realize we're doing it. We're just talking. If she wants to be there, fine. I'll just slide there. She'll slide there. I slide there. It's okay. That's us. You learn your own dance steps. You learn how to communicate. So the wife says, I'm hungry. Let's get something. And the husband says, what? Well, I like some tacos. Mm, we had those last week, the wife says. Okay, how about a sandwich? Mm, I'm not hungry for a sandwich. Okay, Are you, maybe some spaghetti. Mm, I don't want any spaghetti. Okay, uh, how about some Chinese? You know, good idea. I, Get, let's get Chinese. You always choose the best places. I didn't choose anything. I just whittled it down to you finally said. <laughs> That's how it works, right? Am I lying? I'm not lying. <laughs> That's how it is. That's how it is. So is it bad? Is it good? Does it matter? No, it's us. It works that way. And so that submission is not, it's not the ugly thing people think it is. Uh, society will not run in an organized way if we don't have it. 
Homes do not work if we don't have it. And we just love each other enough to yield. And God has made the man the responsible one before him. I have to answer for my wife. And the way that I did what I did, it's a heavy responsibility on me. And that's why it's such a blessing when my wife and I can work together to work out the order so that things can happen. And so it's not lessening a woman. It's not a, a, a weakness on her part. It's an investment in her home. You know, as a man, I'm not at war with women. I love, I love my church. I love women in, in general. I, 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 I love my, my daughters. I have two daughters. I have two daughters-in-law, several granddaughters. I don't encourage them to be weak and helpless. I want them to be all God made them to be. But with that said, the greatest desire I have for them is for them to be under the authority of God. And, and I, I, I believe as a pastor, my encouragement is for the married women to be good wives and good mothers. I want them to be role models to their children. That that's what the Lord would have. Be role models for your children. Children who will raise up eventually and bless you like it says in Proverbs 13. 31, 28, where it says of the virtuous woman, her, her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. To have your children stand up and bless you, to be able to stand up and say, I had the greatest mom. I had the greatest mom. Hardworking, loving, faithful to my dad, cared for us. What's better than that? What's better than that? Oh, I had the sexiest mom. Come on. <laughs> you know? No, I had a good mom. And so the children rise up and, and call her blessed. And so he says, submit to your own husbands as is fitting. It's appropriate. It's proper. In the Lord, there are blessings that come because of it. And husbands, verse 19, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Now, it's interesting how Paul told wives to submit but commanded men to love. When he commanded men to love their wives, that word love there is a Greek word. It's agapao. It's a derivative of the word agape. And it speaks of sacrificial or self-denying love. In Ephesians 5.25, Paul said to the church there, husbands, love your wives. Then he went on to say, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So he's speaking of sacrifice. It's revealing that Jesus loved his church so much he laid down his life for her. Now a husband doesn't save the wife, but a husband takes upon himself the major part of the burden. He willingly bears with her weaknesses. He gives himself up for her and for her alone. He gives himself to her. He washes her with God's word. He presents her to Christ. His love for the Lord and for his wife is sacrificial and it's total. And that evidence is his love for her. It secures, as he's doing this, it secures her love for him. Now, Peter also spoke of the husband's love for and relationship to his wife in 1 Peter 3, 7. He said, husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So in, in what he says, he gives insight into sacrificial love. He says, notice, he says, dwell with your wife. Dwell with them with understanding. The word dwell with them speaks of taking an active interest in your wife. He's saying, get to know her needs. Be acquainted with the things happening in your home. Be considerate towards your wife. Appreciate the work she puts into making a house, into a home. Learn to notice her efforts to make it personal as she uses her creative energy. Do not use your home as your hotel, the place you come home to and just throw your hat and say, where's my food? Make it a place where you show an interest. You know, your wife goes out and she chooses to put some flowers in a vase and put it in a place. Notice it. Say, this is great. Say, honey, I really like it. You really have made this, this house into a home. There's a difference between a house and a home. A house is where people live. A home is where a family lives. And so I want to have a home. And the way I have a home is I, I, I realize it's a place where my wife, Marie, will, will express her creativity, the little things that she does. 
that, that sometimes can go unnoticed. I have to learn to, to notice those things so I can appreciate them because I know it took time for her to do that and to tell her. So dwell with them. Dwell with them with understanding. Make them your, your, your study. It's, it, you know, we, we can see things around us. And, and there are a lot of us men who, who can speak concerning things we really like and appreciate and watch. We can, we can talk about sports all day long or a car that we like or, or things of that nature, material things. But we don't even notice, you know, how, how our wife is dressed that day. We don't notice the things that she did in the house. We don't, we don't appreciate and, and say thank you for those things. And that's what he's saying. Peter is saying it. You need to remember, Peter was a married man. And Peter understood and from a practical way, he could say, you need to dwell with your wife with understanding. You need to make her your center of attention. You need to appreciate the things and take notice of the things that she does. And that's what he's saying to us. Appreciate the work she puts into making that house into a home. And he says, give her honor. Give her honor as, as the weaker vessel. Now, when he says giving honor, that means assign dignity to her. Now, how do I assign dignity to my wife? Well, I assign dignity by the way I speak to her and in the way we speak or I speak of her to other people. When he's speaking of assigning dignity to her, honoring her in that way, the way I speak to my wife encourages or diminishes her personal value. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. It's easy for a husband he may not physically abuse her, but it's not hard for him to verbally abuse, to say things that he knows are cutting and hurtful. He can't hit her anymore, or doesn't want to, or whatever. He's a Christian now. So what does he do? He just belittles her. He puts her down. Doesn't like her hair. Doesn't like the way she's gaining weight. Doesn't like the clothes. She never does anything right. Well, Peter says, no, that's not, that's not, that's not loving your wife. That's not, that's not assigning dignity to her. That's, that's tearing her up. You're piercing her like a sword. So don't treat her that way. She loves you. Speak to her with kindness. Tell her she's beautiful. Tell her how much you love her. There's nothing weak or wrong about that, fellas. A lot of guys, they don't know how to do it. You know? And, and again, as a man, I get it. You know, I'm, I'm not Mr. Soft when it comes to that kind of thing. I understand. You know, I wasn't raised in a home that my father said, I love you. I don't even remember my father ever saying, I love you to my mom. I, I can tell you that. I, you know, I'm standing here and it just hit me. I don't even remember him saying that to her. He may have, I don't remember. I don't remember. He wasn't one who used that terminology. He wasn't one who, who said, baby, I love you. He wasn't that guy. My dad was the guy, like many of our fathers in this room, my dad was a guy who got up at the same time, Monday through Friday, went to work, came home at the same time, put food on the table, shoes on your feet, clothes on your back, took care of you financially. And for my dad, that was saying, I love you. I had to learn my father's language of love in order for me to be able as a kid to say I was loved by my dad. I had to learn that language because he never said it. My father never said it till, he, till the very end. He just showed it. And I had to be that observer of my dad. But I made a decision. I'm going to be the guy who's going to break that. I'm going to be the guy who says, I love you. Now, that wasn't easy. That was very difficult. Because I'm not one in the early days of saying that to anybody. I used to think that a guy who says, I love you to a woman, was just using it as some kind of key to try and get somewhere with her. So I made a practice of not saying, I love you. And so even in our marriage, I wouldn't say. And Marie wanted to hear those words. And I thought, you're needy. I did. I thought, what a needy. I don't ask you to say love, you love me. I know that you do. Why do you have to hear, I love you? Man, uh, you know, Jesus, this is your daughter. But man, something's wrong. Something's wrong with this woman. Because I can't do that. And you know what happened? And again, you know, people, believe it or not, I, I had to take this to the Lord. And, and, and the Lord, through his word and by his spirit, began to teach me there's no weakness in that. That's what it is. You're supposed to assign dignity to her. Husbands, love your wife as a command. Notice there's no command. Wife, love your husband. 
Notice that. You won't find that in Scripture. Someone says, oh, Titus 2. No, what Titus 2 says that the older women are to teach the women how to love their husbands. It doesn't say that they're to teach them to love their husbands, but how to. So the older women teach the younger women how to be a, a, a homemaker, a, a loving wife. That's what older women do for the younger women. The younger women aren't going to teach the younger women how to do it properly. The older woman who's been through the wars and has grown over time and understands these things, that's the one to talk to. She's got experience. And that's what Titus 2 says, right? But it commands the husband. Why? Because the husband's occupied with other things. Adam was already cultivating and naming animals. He was already working in a garden when God gave him a wife. He had to learn to love his wife. She was created to love him. So wives will love you. My wife loves me. I had to learn how to say, I love you. And I have to be honest with you, that was not in my vocabulary. It really wasn't. I had to force myself. And I don't mean it as, if, oh, it's so hard. And it's not hard. But I'm not verbal. You'd be surprised. Because I talk, right? <laughs> You'd be surprised. I'm not verbal. I don't say things. If I'm hurt, she doesn't know it. I don't tell her. Most men don't. Why? Because she'll want me to go to the doctor. <laughs> That's the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not go to the doctor. <laughs> and I keep that commandment. I got a broken wrist. I haven't gone yet. It's been two and a half months. I don't go to the doctor. See, so I'm that man. Forgive me, ladies. So I had to learn to say it, to say it, I love you. And part of the reason I don't is I get emotional. So, got shoes, got food, I'm faithful, that's it. It doesn't work that way. So, I had to learn. Husbands, love your wives. Let them know, assign dignity to them. Speak well of them to her as well as to other people. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So we're not to verbally bully her. We're to share with her how we value her. We don't bring up past sins. We don't raise our voices, yell at her. We don't belittle her. By caring for her, we build up her sense of value and we provoke her to desire to care for us. So as a husband, we're, we're to be gentle, we're to be kind because we want to cherish her. In Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, Paul said husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. So God loves us, and Jesus showed the depth of his love by yielding up his life for us. And then Peter refers to the wife as a weaker vessel. She's called weaker because she's normally physically weaker, but it's also a way of speaking of her tenderness. So treat her gently is what he's saying. Lead her through love, not through force. Treat her like a lady. Treat her as if she's the most important person in your life. This teaches girls what to expect from a man and teaches boys how to treat a lady. As your sons or your daughters watch the way you are with your wife. The little girl's watching daddy, how he treats her, and he's, she's saying within herself, that's how men treat women. And your son, if you have a son, he watches the way you treat your wife, and he's saying within himself, that's how men treat women. That's how it works. I remember speaking to a, a young man who didn't cherish his wife. And he had a young daughter. And I knew that this young man really did love his little girl. So I was speaking to him on one day, and I, I said to him this. I said, you, you, you love your little girl, don't you? And he answered, yes, I do, with all my heart. So I asked him a simple question. How are you going to feel when someone just like you treats your daughter the way that you are treating her mother? And his face kind of like froze for a moment. 
because I happen to know he wasn't treating that little girl, his wife. He was not treating his wife right. One of these days, I told him, some guy just like you is going to take your baby out. Do you want him to treat her the way you treat her mother? Because the way you're doing it isn't right. And it shocked him. It shocked him. But he needed to hear that. He needed to hear that. Uh, a husband cherishes and nourishes his wife. She is God's gift to you. And that's a, that's a good thing. You see, as I've grown older, I've become more aware of the fact that my wife is revealing my ministry. She's the greatest reflection and open expression of my walk with Jesus. In 1 Corinthians eleven seven, 7, it says, a woman is the glory of man. And as we grow older, we should be appreciating and loving one another more deeply. The more we experience together, the greater our bond of love can grow. We go through all of life's ups and downs together. We rent apartments, we, we buy our homes, we have our kids, we raise our kids, we release our kids. Eventually we become grandparents, we bury our parents, we age together, we have a lifetime of memories that draw us closer. I, my wife and I, you know, all we ever talk about basically is, is the Lord and the church and our kids and our grandkids. That's pretty much our boring life. Not the Lord, but our kids. <laughs> but I talk about that all. That's what we talk about. That's what our life is. It's our Lord and our family. People say, oh, pastor, you know, you, you, you ought to teach more on family in other places. I, say, I don't like to teach on family. That's not my thing, believe it or not. It's just what I do hold very dear, and it comes out when I teach. And it shows. Because I have been blessed. And, and, and I speak of those things because God has been good. It hasn't been easy. We've worked a long time. You know, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's like I have my hand here with my fingers open and her hand. And we have had to find a way for us to be able to piece our lives together. And, it, and it's, it's work. It isn't always easy. It, it, sometimes we, we bang into each other and we, but it's worth it. It's worth it. At the end of the day, when I put my head on my pillow, my wife's next to me and I, and I hear her snoring. <laughs> I tell her, get me a burrito, I'm hungry. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's all good. It's all good. But we go through so many things. We have a catalog of history. Song of Solomon Chapter 8, verse 7 simply says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. You see, we are heirs together of the grace of life. Your wife is not less than you. Your wife and you both stand equally before God. Peter says we're heirs together. We equally, equally share in the need and the grace of God. So, as such, I'm to encourage her walk in the Lord and to endeavor to be the man she respects. I can have the respect of men and people who don't know me, and I appreciate it. And I want to live in a way that people do respect me. God knows that's true. But the one I really want to respect me the most in my whole life is my wife. I want her respect. I want her respect more than the respect of anybody else. She is my closest companion. She lives with me. She knows my heart. She knows my secrets. She knows everything. So I want to live in a way that she can say, I respect that man. I was taught that by my father. My father lived in a way he was respected. My mom used to say, he's a little man, but he's highly respected. And it's true. Because he had character, he had integrity, he was a hard worker, and he loved us to the end. That's what I want to be. Husbands, love your wives, love them, yield to them, serve them. You can give her 100%, guess what? She will give you 150% back. 
That's how it works in good marriages. And so Peter made it very clear for us to do that so our spiritual life will, will grow. Don't lord it over her, but lead her. I serve her. I care for her spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. I have to deny myself, and I learn to do that by degrees daily. We have to pray together in fellowship. We worship and read. We serve together. And then finally, Paul said, don't be bitter towards them. The word bitter means to render angry, to make them indignant or to become irritated. Do not be ill-tempered. Don't be rude. It results in them doing the same to you. Instead, love them. Treat them with gentleness and respect. And I'll close with one question. Think about this. How many divorces occur because the wife is submitted and the husband is too sacrificial? How many divorces will occur because the wife is too submitted and the husband is too sacrificial? I would say no divorces occur because the wife is submitted and the husband is sacrificial. And that keeps them together in the Lord. Father, we would ask that you would work in us in such a way that we would love one another. As the woman respects and submits, may the husband sacrifice and serve.